Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is October 16th, 2023, and we are here in part three of our interview with Josh and Kim Coffin. Hey, y'all. How's it going? <laughs> Thanks for joining us. <laughs> back again. Um, we, we have been covering this week um, sort of the fallout from the Ruby Frankie uh, eight passengers... Uh, Jody Hildebrandt, Tim Ballard, O.U.R., Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow, um, just sort of disaster that's been befalling Mormonism over the past year. I call it Mormon neo-fundamentalism. Others call it Mormon prepperism. Um, and we've been covering all the connections to this book, Visions of Glory, uh, written by um, a man named Tom Harrison, Harrison, who is a therapist here in Utah along the Wasatch Front. And uh, we're not going to be, we, we've covered in parts one and two, uh, Kim and Josh's Mormon stories, uh, Kim being raised by kind of prepper Mormon parents, um, Josh being raised by more traditional Idaho believing faithful Mormon parents and uh, their marriage. And then eventually... Uh, their experiences with Kim's dad, who still is a leader of an online um, Mormon internet prepper group called Avow, and uh, its relationship and Kim's dad's relationship with Chad Daybell uh, and the prepper movement and his responsibility in helping make Chad Daybell and Julie Rowe um, and eventually Lori Vallow uh, what they became. And uh, we are uh, we are now on part three, and part three is Margie's favorite part. Right, Margie? I'm here for it. Um, and also mm -hmm. uh, the part that Josh and Kim are most excited about, which is the healing and growth that comes after deconstruction for Mormonism or from a high-demand religion. So where we left off in part two was them starting to question their faith as they found out that the friend that Kim's dad had defended, Chad Daybell, uh, is likely, according to allegations, the murder or complicit in the murder of his own wife and uh, possibly complicit or at least aware of the murder, the murders of uh, Lori Vallow's uh, two children and her ex, at least one ex-husband and her brother, bunch of murder and mayhem, um, and this causing Kim after her dad defends Chad Vallow and then has to correct his error, her starting to question not just the patriarchal order that she was raised in with her dad at the helm, but also Mormon prepperism, Mormon neo-fundamentalism, and eventually, possibly, Orthodox Mormonism. So where, first of all, Margie, welcome back. Thank you. And yep. are you excited? Yes. Yeah, it's good to have you. Thank you. And uh, Kim and Josh, where do you all want to begin part three? Do you want to lead? Sure, I can dive in. Um, I think at the time, uh, Kim and I were always kind of different, different believers. I was a utility member where I truly was there for the community. Um, I loved the community. I loved the extended family, the reunions, the BYU network mm -hmm. for career paths, um, BYU-Idaho as well. Kim was a validity member, tr true believing, very, very much dedicated to all, all of the doctrine. And we didn't really ever get into it too much because I just didn't really want to, I guess. Um, I, I was perfectly fine being a community um, utility member and... I think you started to question after obviously that went down with your dad and, and, and Chad Daybell, but you started to question some of the, the core aspects of the church. I think you had mm -hmm. heard about these essays mm -hmm. and you, were to, you wanted to disprove them. Like, oh, the essays can't possibly, I'm going to go research these. And Yeah, so what was, happen, what was happening was you had a friend from college who reached out and you had kept in fairly good contact with him throughout the years. And I had always respected his opinions on things. He was very well researched, very well read and thought out. And he was sharing some of his concerns about 
some of the church doctrine with you. And I had overheard, I think it was, was he like, um, what was that message? You Marco had? Polo. Marco yeah. Polo. I had heard you both chatting back and forth. And I thought, oh, he's struggling with the Mormon doctrine after reading the gospel essays. I mean, that's on the LDS website. How could you struggle with Mormon doctrine if you're not reading anti-Mormon literature? And I was like, well, give this to me. I will go research this. I love a good deep dive. That's uh, the <laughs> autism and the ADHD. And I was like, just let me have this. I'll go figure it out. We'll, we'll let him know. Like, he's safe. We'll figure it out. So I go and I start reading the gospel essays that are on LDS.org. And we'll and have Julia include a link to the gospel topics essays. Yes, thank you. That were released in late 2013, mm -hmm. sometime 2014. Mm -hmm. And I had read them previously, probably about two or three years previously. And at that time in my life, didn't have too much issue with them. But I think a lot of things had shifted over the past few years that I wasn't maybe fully aware with. So I jump in and I start reading them and I jump in with the thought that everything that I have been taught my entire life is that anything that is on the church's website is safe, will bring you further light. It, it can't take you away from the church. I'm not going to go on any of the anti-Mormon websites, obviously. So I start reading through them and I make sure to read all of the footnotes because I that's the type of studier I always was like even with the Book of Mormon and with the Bible I was always like I want to read the footnotes because I want to extra understand mm -hmm. what's going on and probably again themes of scrupulosity I need to have that like better understanding so that I can better prepare myself for what's coming so I start diving in and I'm reading the footnotes and the footnotes do take you to a few different sources outside, but they're approved sources, things that they are referencing. And so I read those as well. And this is probably over the course of, I would say, two or three days. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite a lot to sift through if you're really reading everything. And I mean, within the course of two to three days, everything that I believe in is falling apart. And I'm learning about things that I wasn't aware of. What are just some examples? So for instance, what are all the things in there? There first is vision accounts. the first vision account where there are multiple. multiple different versions that Joseph has shared. That the, one was the conflict. Yeah. The conflicting versions. And for me, I was just astonished by the fact that the person who had founded our church, how could you have multiple versions of something that happened I don't understand that. That's Why is big... your story changing so much, yes. so many times? Yes, that should be the same story told exactly the same every time. Maybe you embellish on it a little, okay, but not changing who appears to you or how they are appearing. Or what they say. Or what they say. I took some pretty big issues with that. So that one was very unsettling. You keep reading and you start reading about blacks in the priesthood. How were people treated Previously, race in the, the race in the priesthood. The, I say. Sorry, yeah. race in the priesthood. Yeah. Yes, um, how were members treated before, and that one was very unsettling. This was also during, I would say, it was during like a lot of the Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. stuff was going on, mm -hmm. and so maybe I was more aware of that, and more aware than I had been in the past. And as an influencer too, you felt the need to stand up for. Yeah. A marginalized community, right? I had that was spent a lot more time researching and trying yeah. to understand mm -hmm. how are other people feeling because my experience as a white person living in Idaho is is not I limited, yeah. Yeah, it's very limited. Yeah. And then I think too also you there was the the book of Abraham. The book of Abraham was kind of a joke. I was very much a literal believer too of everything within Mormonism and the Bible and the Book of Mormon. So I took some issues there. Uh, polygamy was hard for you too because women are also a marginalized community and you felt the need to stand up for women. And Polygamy was a big one. Which ones am I missing? It's quite a few of them. Um, <laughs> there's the translation stuff. There's the Book of Mormon, yeah. DNA, and you know that kind of thing. Yes. All the Book of Mormon historicity, basically. Yeah, right. It just all starts adding up and it's like this snowball effect. And I'm... I remember just breaking down in tears, like how 
is everything that I've believed in. Like This is my life's purpose. This is everything I've worked towards. How was I lied to about some of these things? How, how were these things kept from us in primary? How were we not t- taught some of these basic things? How did I not know that Joseph had a, a hat and a stone and like that? It's now taught, but it and wasn't. And the plates weren't in the room. And yeah. the plates weren't in the, the room. Pictures of the like, plates. There were just so many things that were adding up, and it was so upsetting. And I think Dark Night of the Soul is like really the only way you can explain. It's the most painful thing. It's not like I was out there searching for a way to get out of Mormonism or looking to sin or looking to sin. I didn't want to go commit sins. I that wasn't. That wasn't in the plan for me at all. It was, I'm trying to better understand Mormonism so that I can defend Mormonism to other people and keep friends inside of the church. We don't want them to leave. Um, And so it came to me as a huge shock that I could begin to have this deconstruction process all within approved materials. And then you brought it to me. I brought it to you. For some reason, I think one of the things... (laughs) that we've noticed about me is that I always think like a man knows more than me. And I think within Mormonism, sometimes you are taught like defer to a man. If you don't know then a man will be able to lead and guide. He has more spiritual insight. He has guidance for the family. And so I came to you thinking you must know about all of these things. And I was upset. I was really hurting. Yeah. You're like, you're, you're the return missionary. Like, why don't you know all these things? And I I knew some of them, but I, I had chosen to look the other way. The community utility member in me wanted to just keep things how they were. And so she finally came to me and you were angry. You were like, we need to talk about this. I was very distraught. Why didn't you tell me? Like, we should have known this. And then to me, I was like, whoa, 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 slow down. What does this mean? What does this mean for our families, our Mm -hmm. extended families, our cousins, the family reunion in two weeks? Are we telling the world? Because to me, this is very definitive. Like if we're not in, that changes all of our relationships. And to me, that's all I cared about was the community. Mm. And and to have a network locally, ge- geographically within my ward, to have the BYU alumni network at my disposal. I have 20,000 connections on LinkedIn. I care a lot about the BYU network um, for networking and careers. To me, it would put all the communities on the line for me. Like, are we going to give all this up? Because mm-hmm. we were misled. And um, that was really hard for both of us, but in very different ways. Hers was about the validity of the truth, and mine was about what does this mean for our future and our community and our family. Mm -hmm. And so I remember I even started looking into like other forms of Mormonism, like ones that had veered off, like, well, maybe someone else got it right. Like maybe Joseph wasn't perfect, but maybe like someone else got it right. So I looked into different, like I looked into the FLDS. I looked into have to remind me, what are the other names? Um, Community of Christ. Community of Christ. Um, and I was like, maybe someone else has it right. I looked into it. Nope, they did, that doesn't seem right either. And I was like, I, there, you know, there has to be a way. How can I hold on to my faith? I don't want to lose this. It's, it means too much to me. This is everything. And so I tried every way that I could to make sense of it. You know, reading apologist materials and... There was no way to make sense yeah. of it. And then to see it summarized after the essays in the CES letter and also in letter to my wife was one that I came across. And that one was such an intimate reading because it was like, I don't want to lose my relationship with my spouse because of these things I found out. That was the writer's kind of intent. And for me, I was it was all crumbling, like our eternal marriage and all this family and community. Like, what does this all mean? Like we do leave this church together and, but you can't deny once you, once you get into the rabbit hole, it's so hard. You can't just, I mean, I, I had in a way sort of, I hadn't done a deep dive though. I had said, I don't really want to look into polygamy. Like it's kind of this area of that we're embarrassed about as a, as a, as a church and, and the blacks in the priesthood, the race in the priesthood, I didn't, want to know too much about it because it's like, those are the subjects you avoid on your mission. You just don't want to get too into that. And so having to look at it and ha- look through the essays with her, jump into the CS letter, it didn't take long to get into the letter and say, this is, it's all summarized. It's all here. How do I deny this? Like it forced me to have to face it all, which then led us to what does this mean now for our future? And that was what was, I was trying to avoid. Mm-hmm. It's like, just keep the status quo. Mm-hmm. We're in, we're in good standing with both of our families 
We go to all the cousin weddings at all the temples where that picture perfect family, where the old, I'm the oldest cousin. Mm-hmm. I kind of wanted to keep it that way. And so you you even asked, like, well, can you leave the church, but can we still do all of the family activities and can we still just make it work? Like, how do we make both of these things happen? And I was a bit obstinate. <laughs> and um, I, I said, no, I I can't go to church with you. I cannot let our, ba- our daughter get baptized. I cannot support these things if this isn't true. Like there is no room for error based on everything that we've been told. Like if Joseph Smith lied to us <laughs> and like the very foundation, I guess, of the church is untrue, how does any of this matter? How does it have meaning? And I can't support that. And I was worried about the, the milestones though. Yeah. And, and I think you were shocked how worried I was about your mom and my mom mm-hmm. and grandma and grandma and gra- all the grandmas mm-hmm. that our seven-year-old at the time, mm-hmm. our oldest, was a year away from baptism. And I was just deathly afraid of having to confront my mother-in-law and my mother and everyone else about how we're maybe not going to baptize her, right? And that was kind of, even after I knew it was all untrue, even after I'd done the deep dive, I still thought maybe I could still baptize my daughter, just to go along, to get along with mm-hmm. my family, to avoid the confrontation of we are going to step out and be the only ones. Um, but eventually Kim helped me realize like, no, like that's not. And also therapy helped too to kind of like own your own voice. It's okay to say no to this for your family. It's your children. Mm-hmm. Even though they're grandkids too, it's your children. You choose their future. Yeah. But it's so painful leaving the Mormon religion because you lose your identity as a person, but you also lose family in a sense. And all of the things that you've done around every holiday, you know, all of these, what are those called? Why can't I think? Traditions? Traditions. Traditions. Yeah. You lose all of these family values and traditions and traditions are such a core part of people. Mm -hmm. And to have that ripped away from you, like suddenly Christmas doesn't have the same meaning. Mm. Suddenly Mm. Easter doesn't have the same meaning to me at least. Um, and now I'm questioning also my belief in God, like, and this is really painful. Mm -hmm. And within Mormonism, if you leave the Mormon faith, it's like you leave everything behind and you're ostracized. Whereas with other religions, you can leave the faith and you're still part of the community or you can still participate. You aren't ostracized or you aren't excommunicated if you do something out of line and so it's really painful because, oh. Yeah, the space for non-believers. You, you talk to, to Jews or Muslims or Hindi, Hindu or uh, they have space for non-believers within their, you know, with, some of them do, right? They, yeah. they hold the space for it. It's like, I'm still a Jew. Or I'm still, uh, we're still Mormons. Like we're still, even though we're ex-Mormons, like yeah. it's our it's heritage. It's a fundamental part it's, of how we were. It's the people I understand. Up. It's the people I resonate with. But there, it's an all or nothing thing, and so you're ostracized immediately. You lose your community. You lose your your access to the the, the neighborhood directory, um, and you just lose so much community right away. And there's no way to really get that back because you're sort of taboo. And so that was just hard for us to kind of face all of the the loss mm-hmm. of community that it's not true for you. It was really the dark night of the soul. It was just like and it wasn't something we wanted or no. sought out really wasn't. I was happy in the Mormon church. I loved the religion. I loved the security that it brought me. I loved my relationship with what I felt like my relationship was with Jesus and God. And it was very painful to lose all of that. And so quickly too, to have it deteriorate so quickly. Yeah. It was really painful. It was hard. Where were you living when all of this was happening? Utah County. At the time we were in Utah County. Wow, yeah. yeah. So Which it, was very a, intense. Yeah, very intense environment. I think another piece too that we didn't really think about much, but Kim was also working and started up a business. And I think, I mean, it was 2019. And for a woman to work didn't seem like it was a big deal. <laughs> but we were constantly told like, are you... Are you, we had a Relief Society president ask us, are you comfortable with other people raising your children? Mm-hmm. Because we had a nanny that worked oh, in our home. Part-time, 15 part-time. hours a week. So they, she questioned Kim about whether or not she's okay with someone else raising our kids. Mm-hmm. And why do you need to work? Does your husband not make enough? And I was like, I remember hearing this, like, is this the 1950s? Like, 
she's allowed to work. Like, what is this? Right. I was very, very angry about that. I was like, it wasn't even about the money. It was, she would like to have some fulfillment outside of motherhood. Mm -hmm. It's not an end all be all. And so we very quickly became sort of uh, feminists in a way that like yeah. women can do what they want to do. And it's not, man, men cannot control women's choice. I would never tell you not to work. Mm -hmm. So I was just, that was hard for us. And Utah County was one of the worst. I mean, I think that whole neighborhood had stay at home moms and nothing against the stay at home yeah. mom. Like do what's best for your family. Definitely. Everyone has a different circumstance, but do not shame another woman mm -hmm. for wanting to work and build their own business. Mm -hmm. That was definitely a pillar that fell quickly. And when it was interesting how quickly people's view of my business changed too, because when I was in the church mm -hmm. and it was successful, it was like, look at this gift that God has given or rewarded you with for your faithfulness. And now suddenly as we're leaving and it's getting even more successful, it's, oh, you, <laughs> this is from the devil. Like you've, you're worshiping Satan. And so he's giving you money. Um, what was your dad's phrase about that? You sold, you sold your, sold your, you sell yourself to the devil. Well, you sold your soul and you you gave your signs and tokens for fame and money. Yeah. Something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And Kim was like, I'm just trying to be a small business owner. I yeah. just want you to be proud of me. I just want to be validated by my parents that I'm I'm providing, I'm doing a good job, I'm mm -hmm. I'm a good mother and I'm a good CEO. And and of course none of that came. It was all because we left the church that her success was sort of undermined, mm -hmm. which was so hard because she had worked so hard. And it was blessings before. Mm -hmm. And then it became sort of just disobedience. That was really hard to watch. Mm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough stuff. Um, thank you for sharing. And uh, it's just <clears throat> people don't come to understand how difficult it is and what it is unless people are willing to talk about it. So thank you for being willing to talk about it. Oftentimes people talk about the faith crisis part as being harder than coming out as LGBT or even having a loved one die. Like this can be a very, very difficult, destabilizing and even brutal thing to experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, <clears throat> from the deconstruction, while it was so hard, I think the reconstruction or the rebuilding of our life after was was where we find the most joy because it feels hopeless when you're going through it all. It feels like you're losing everything, but you know, you still have to push forward and raise a family and, and, and you have a marriage in place. And there are so many things you have to rethink. You basically start to question all of the systems, all of the institutions, all of the hierarchies, the, the male authority figures, the male power patriarchy. figures, the patriarchy alone. And I'd always been a pretty equal partner, but there were several bias things that I had still had that I was not fully equal. And you well, know, even things, a lot of times it was ideas that I was furthering that I would say, no, please don't do that. That's my role. I don't want you to come into my womanly domain. <laughs> and a lot of times you were trying to be helpful and I didn't fully believe that that was something you should be doing. So I remember we just were changing both. diapers for children or staying up late with babies. We had a very mm -hmm as equal as possible with young, young children. Yeah. We tried to be as equal as possible. And she was so shocked, like, this is not what a man does. He doesn't change diapers. He doesn't care about laundry. He doesn't do mm -hmm. things domestically. Um, well, I had grown up with really strict gender roles where my father, it was sometimes felt like living in the 1950s. Like my father went to work and when he came home, dinner needed to be made for him and everyone needed to be quiet and there was no loud noises because dad had worked a hard day and my mother was there to provide for the children and to make the food. And there were very strict gender roles. And so as we created our own family, you know, I just wanted to mimic what I had seen because that's what I thought was right. And there were definitely some things that needed to be questioned and changed. So that was really good. Yeah. Mm. So we started to rebuild the, the there's, there isn't a role there. It's, we, we share. And I, I luckily stumbled into some coaching right away. So I hired Julie Hanks, who was to me a great bridge builder in this space. Uh, I think sometimes um, ex Mormon creators can be, and there's all kinds of them, right? And I think some of the, the bridge builders like Julie Hanks, who's still a Mormon, um, she is that bridge to, start to question things like like misogyny and like 
uh, the different patriarchy things. And, and mm -hmm. that was a great bridge for me to cross first before I started to look at other things after that. And without Julie Hanks and the coaching there and even uh, Dr. Finlayson Fife and some of these mm -hmm. other folks doing great work in the middle there, um, that allowed me to kind of see this emotional load. Julie Hanks talks a lot about emotional load and like how women stereotypically take more of that on and how I can step up as a man and do more around the house, more with my children mm -hmm. and have more of an equal partnership. And that was a great rebuilding for us to say we can do that together and rebuild our family together. Can I ask you a really quick question back yeah. to deconstruction for a sure. minute? There are oftentimes um, John has like identified some pillars some quick pillars that kind of the church fills, let's just say holes, maybe you say, um, that you, oftentimes we don't even recognize until we go through like a deconstruction. And I thought I would just, because this will help guide also rebuilding, knowing what some of the holes were. Mm. But if you can just um, let me know if you feel like individually you felt like there was loss here. And then can we touch on grief and loss for a minute? Um, so the first thing would be uh, around, it's not just a loss of faith, right? What comes with this sort of loss uh, or faith transition is um, a loss of identity. Did you both feel that? You can go first. We want. definitely did feel a loss of identity. I think you struggled with that one more than I did. Yeah, I think that the church is set up for the male figurehead, the, what do they call it, the head of household, mm -hmm. right? So the authority, the power of the priesthood, male worship in some ways. And so I think I obviously benefited from that system, right? I And I didn't even know it sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. I just, it was just what the way it was. And uh, suddenly you lost your faith, but then you've lost your authority and you lost your power. And you've not that I cared that much about those, but that suddenly I wasn't the one responsible for everything. And suddenly the callings and the things that I did that, you know, the, the, all of the, the, the men did were no longer important. And mm -hmm. um, the networking, the careers, the, the network of people, it was an identity crisis for me mm -hmm. because everyone, everyone I had ever known or loved or met the majority, 90 to 95% were, were LDS. Mm -hmm. uh, the few 5% that wasn't were from work that I might have met in traveling and consulting and things. And so my whole network is LDS. It's so scary to start to face that network of people. Yeah. Who am I? I was a BYU-Idaho graduate. I was a return missionary. I like that. Those were core identity pieces and pillars of my life mm -hmm. that are now gone. So who am I now? Exactly. Well, and, and even who am I in the future? Yeah. Because yes. really one of the things that shook you so greatly was I no longer have this security and knowledge that we will be together in the eternities. And how does that affect our relationship now? Now that we have the ability to choose whether we both want to be in this marriage and stay together. So is that also like a marriage pillar yeah, that went marriage down pillar. where... Yeah. I questioned, I said, what is marriage? Yeah. Right. I was questioning everything. Right. Yes. But, but at some point I said, what is marriage? Like, you were 18. I was 21. What, what is this? Yeah. What is parenting? What is like, what, why did we make all these choices? It almost was like we were doing all these things on a checklist that they wanted us to do. Mm -hmm. And at age 32, when you were 29, starting to first question like, who am I and what do I actually want for my life? I'm no longer living for my grandpa and what career he wants me to do yeah. and what my mother thinks I should be doing and what my and what my uncle thinks and, you know, what they think I should be doing with my Sunday and with my callings and everything's questioned now. And so even marriage was a pillar that fell and, and it forced us to be honest with each other. A lot of Mormons like to say that ex-Mormons all get divorced and all want to go sin. And sure, there are a lot of marriages that do separate after they leave the church. Mm -hmm. But it's not because being an ex-Mormon ruins marriages. It's that you, uh, sometimes the church was all they had in common. Mm -hmm. And you remove the church from the marriage and they have, they're have they forced to actually have other things in common and do other things together. And I think for us, luckily, we had some other pillars mm -hmm. that, you know, parenting together and and certain like shared a, a sh interests. shared interest, a shared business, mm -hmm. and 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 also just a wanting to show up for each other and choose each other. Yeah. Like even if we don't know what marriage is anymore, if it's not this eternal thing that we can have reassurance of, 
what, you know, what is, we can still show up each day and choose each other. And that can be what a marriage is, right? And marriage doesn't have to be so prescribed and controlled by sort of a, a higher authority or a, or a or institution. Yeah. And that was brutal for me. I think that was, that was really painful. Painful. so hard because I just was like, this is what gives me joy. If I die, I'm with you forever and the kids are forever. And, and there's, there's some peace in the ceiling and the, mm-hmm. and the forever families. And to lose that is just, it's the anxiety there is crushing for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the identity piece too for for women sometimes can look a little bit different than for men in that, at least in my experience and in coaching um, a lot of women, is it's just this absolute feeling of being lost inside yourself of just like, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I like. I don't know. It, it's sort of this sense of like, how do I connect with myself and, and honestly, where do I go from here? You know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and I love that marital piece as well, the marriage piece. Um, and almost having like, it sounds like a version of marriage die mm-hmm. in order to give birth to um, another version which feels really scary. Like, I think it's the scariest thing is when you don't know what's next. All you're looking at is rubble. All you're looking at is what's gone down, right? Yeah, that's a fair statement. It's really scary. Yeah, it was scary. Yeah. It was hard. I think it, the honesty with each other, right, to say, like, we have to start from scratch. Like, we don't, what, what do we do? We, we, we were still together. We still have these kids. We still, yeah. we have these shared things, but like, we have to, we have to show up. And yeah. for you, I think it allowed you to be safer too, right? And be more authentic. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you want to touch on. Yeah. So with leaving the church, that gave me the space to come out to you about my own sexuality, being somewhere on the LGBTQIA spectrum. Um, and that was not something that I ever previously was even close to being able to talk about. I grew up with very homophobic father who made terrible comments. Um, and, and I would have never ever said anything in my home because it wasn't safe to. So having that distance from him leaving the church that allowed me to finally start exploring that reading about it, trying to understand, you know, your what atta- is this? Your and attraction and sexuality yeah, template. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And that was that came as a big shock to you. That was hard. Yeah, I think. I mean, that was. I it, it took a lot of therapy for me to understand that. I just think it was it was hard for me as to, just to understand it. But like you were, you you shared this precious truth with me, and you came out to me. You trusted me, and we wouldn't have had that trust had we mm-hmm. stayed in the church. Mm-hmm. There was no authenticity. It was check the boxes follow the script and draw it to the end. And I also revealed to you too, that I occasionally looked at porn and occasionally masturbated. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to take that to the grave. I thought that, you know, I thought maybe I had an addiction or maybe, you know, like once or twice a month, I'd look at something to try to fulfill a need. And I thought maybe this is, I have to take this. I can't tell anyone. I can't hold a calling. I don't want her to know. I don't want her to think that I think less of her and my attraction to her. I don't want to devastate her. Um, and there is a lot of bad in the pornography industries. And I, I think that's, there's some terrible things there and I don't fully support that, but there are women owned creators who create the, that kind of thing and more ethical, options. ethical <laughs> options and things like that. And Tiffany Rowe talks a lot about Belesa and other things. And I was just so devastated that that's something I'm, I'm going to take that to my grave. I'm not going to ever share that I I, I lust in my heart after someone else occasionally. And for when her, to- I thought I would never share my sexuality because one of those things we talked about earlier with that book was the idea that you have these evil spirits around you at any time. And so another idea I was taught was anytime you voice something that you feel tempted by or something that you're struggling with, those evil spirits immediately have more power to control you because they now know what's going on in your head. So in my mind, again, this is a more scrupulous belief was that 
it keeps me safe to never admit any weakness, to never admit anything that I'm tempted by or that I'm struggling with. And so I never spoke a word of it to anyone. Like I wouldn't even let the thought ruminate because even in that book, it says if you have a thought and don't immediately cast it out, if it sits for too long, that even allows those spirits to start having more power over you, which is it's such a terrible belief system to have that you have no choice in this matter, that there's just these powers and these beings that can enter your body. <laughs> like that's so terrible, especially for someone dealing with OCD, where I already have intrusive thoughts that I'm fighting off all the time. Because with intrusive thoughts, you can have terrible things pop into your brain at any point in time. And I'm already fighting that thinking like, I must be a terrible person because I have bad thoughts come into my head. Yeah. And it, at least how I understand the treatment of OCD, the, the treatment is not to draw more attention, more intensity to the thoughts you're having. Mm -hmm. It's to allow them to be, you know, to Held have some loosely. space. That's yes. right. To, to be able to hold some space around mm -hmm. them as opposed to like really. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Okay. Can I ask also back to the holes? How about, um, I'm curious, you've mentioned community. Did you both feel a loss of community through your transition, mm -hmm. your faith yeah, transition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just family, extended family, friends, um, BYU network, just so many people that I had shallow connections with that I thought were deeper connections. And then you pull the church, you strip the church away and there's not as much in common. And there's also an awkwardness, right? Where, oh, I don't know if I want to catch the flu that he has. They literally Me think that- Meaning the faith crisis. The faith crisis. <laughs> like if he's, if I it go spend too on much me. time with him, he might try to convince me. It's like, well, we can still be friends. Is this, this is the only thing we have in common? There's so many other things. And it just becomes an awkwardness with cousins and- and big boundaries are put in place. You have to re reform boundaries because others will try to convince you to come back, right? Mm -hmm. You're become a project and that's not safe either. And that's not great friendship. That's not authentic friendship or, or family either. So they always kind of have that ulterior motive of bringing you back. And so absolutely, it's been the, one of the loneliest, loneliest roads. Um, family, friends, BYU, just all the folks I used to really hold in high regard. They used to hold me in high regard. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget um, one experience with, with our alma mater that was crushing where oh, just makes me mad thinking about it. But um, Kim's, Kim had created this business and she had just been killing it, right? She just from scratch, mother of stay at home, mother of three and be you would quit your job. I quit my job to join her. I was in tech and I quit to join her and in the middle of the pandemic and we got reached out to by BYU Idaho's alumni network, and they wanted to sh share a story, a feature about us as a couple. We were both alumni, and we did a whole interview with Utah Valley Magazine's own company, and uh, I think it's Bennett Productions, and we did all of these types of Bennett Communications. We did this huge interview and talked all about her business, and it was all for BYU Idaho Alumni Magazine. And we got to the very end of it, and the BYU alumni director called us and said, and I had shared a Mormon stories story mm -hmm. in my story. And I don't think we had fully even left the church at this point. I no. think you just listened to Mormon stories and I like, shared, I shared one story something. and this alumni director was a friend on Instagram mm -hmm. and saw that I shared something about Mormon stories. And so he, he felt sure. prompted, he felt prompted to call me and say, before we publish you on the cover of the BYU Idaho alumni magazine for this quarter, about your wife's amazing business and this couple, I need to make sure and check on your recommends. And they had just expired because we were planning on not renewing them. And, and it was COVID. <laughs> and it was COVID and we just weren't going back. And I had to say, well, we don't have them. And so they pulled the entire interview. And I, I just, I was like, aren't you a secular institution too? Doesn't it matter that she's had financial and secular success in the real world? Apart from her faith in the in the the, the 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 church that backs the institution, and I was just so mad because my wife's blood, sweat, and tears in this business and mine was invalidated because I might be an apostate or I might not have my temple recommend, 
And none of the questions asked about our faith. It was all about the business. Mm -hmm. It was just how successful have you been? Tell us about that. And that was devastating because, like, we're still alumni. Mm -hmm. I I feel shame now putting my my alma mater on my resume. In fact, I I often put a little thing, a little blurb about I don't I don't support the policies by the administration about um, how they treat LGBTQ members and. I always, I always, I always People preface that with employers mm-hmm. because I don't, color. I don't agree with the policies, mm-hmm. uh, but that's my, that's where my degree's at. And so I, so anyway. <laughs> let's talk about what's really important. You still root for the football and the basketball teams. <laughs> yeah. Still, the Cougars, it died so quick. I was <laughs> such a huge one. fan and she's like so such sad to see that fan. die. I used to go to all the football games and had all the <laughs> Cougar flags and huge BYU fan and I went to go I was to go to the BYU NBA conferences and I had all these huge great connections to these prominent Mormon leaders that would come to the BYU NBA conference and um and that was just quickly dissolved once you once you're out yeah it's, mm-hmm. the, compu- the I feel like the community piece is is it's a big one mm-hmm. and so multi-layered as you said like family we're talking about like our families our f- like friends, yeah. our professional yeah. Um, peers, our, yeah. yeah. Okay, how about parenting? When it came to parenting, did you guys feel that whole of just sort of, wow, what do we do now? It definitely changed the way that we were parenting about that same time. So let's think we left. 2019, 2020. Mormonism and 2020, July which is of still 2020. Quite, so it's quite recent. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's been three years, a little over three years. Yeah, and then a little bit after that, I started learning about autism. Yeah, that and was, I was like, so oh, therapy, wow. therapy. Is, we started. Was therapy? that part of the rebuilding? Mm-hmm. Yes. Or was that part of the loss? Okay, oh, I'm going to ask you about that. Oh. Okay, mm-hmm. I am going to ask so you the, about that. But I'm curious mm. how. Parent the the parenting loss showed up. Yes. Like, what did it make you feel? The the like, what was it that you felt like you lost? Control and security. Like all of a sudden, I don't have this guidebook that I can follow. And mm. I was, I was such an annoying Mormon. Um, I would always read <laughs> like if they had a manual or a handbook for any calling, I was like, mm, I'm going to read that because I need to know every single rule. Again, themes of OCD. (laughs) Um, I have this like insatiable thirst for knowledge and answers and truth. And so all of a sudden, all of these answers, all of this research that I've done, it no longer really applies to us. And we're starting from the ground. How do we parent? If our goal is no longer to be an eternal family and to make it to heaven and to make sure that our kids get baptized and get the priesthood and Couldn't go on missions the things. and milestones. And yeah. Mormon milestones. What are our goals now? Like life feels like we don't have a path to follow and we don't have a guide and there's no man in our life to tell us you should be doing this. It really caught, I think through therapy, mental health awareness, we learned about neurodivergent traits, autism, ADHD, sort of the spectrum of, special needs or, or sensory issues or things that we notice in our children and even in Kim and others and myself too with ADHD, mm-hmm. that we might have to have different types of parenting strategies where it's not just this checklist of things you can and can't do and how you should raise them. And it was less fear and more love, mm-hmm. which is more difficult because the church prescribes a template that you must follow, but it's actually easy to just send your kids to nursery, send your kids to primary, send them to young men's, young women's. And a lot of times you can let leaders and other parents raise your kids and kind of set the outline. Whereas when you pull them from all those systems, Mm -hmm. you have to say, what do I want to teach them? What do I have to actually work hard at? Mm -hmm. And it makes you reevaluate like how much of a crutch sometimes parents were leaning on the church to take care of raising their kids. And so Mm -hmm. it causes us to say, okay, do we want a parent with fear? Do we want a parent with love? Do we want to be gentle parents? Do we want, because any kid will respond to fear. Fear is effective, but it's not kind and it's, it causes problems in the long term. But at what cost? Like what you had said, could you say that again? When we were speaking earlier, you said, um, we were speaking about like authoritarian parenting and how that can affect a child. Yeah. Was that when we were talking about control versus connection? Mm-hmm. And that, yes. 
you might with, let's just say, a very compliant child, Mm -hmm. you may be able to get them to do what you want. So the behavior you want can be, you know, you may get that, but oftentimes, and and I don't think children are that different from us as adults, that if we're treated that way, Mm -hmm. how do we feel even Mm -hmm. if we do the thing? Let's say we are compliant and there's a whole other, like if a child isn't, right, or has a will or has a, Mm -hmm. but like what's lost is trust in that person a sense of connection with that person or so, yeah, I'm really excited to, to hear more about how you rebuilt with parenting. I think the last hole oftentimes for people can be this sense of, um, let's just say like more existential, Mm. um, kind of, uh, let's just say that realm, like, where am I going when I die? Mm -hmm. What do I believe about, you know, this life? What do I believe about people in my life who have died? Um, and did, did that touch you as well? That definitely created a huge void for us of what happens next. And at first I felt this need to go, I have to go research and I have to find out what happens next. I need to know, I need something to follow, some template guidebook. I can't just be out there figuring things out on my own because at that point in life, I had never had to sit quietly with myself and think, what do I want in my life? What do I value in my life? It had always been told to me. And that's really pretty easy when you don't have to question things, when you don't have to make decisions for yourself. And then all of a sudden it's like, wow. Well, being and sort of saying, being okay with saying, I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. there's there's a lot of power there because mm-hmm. people want the reassurance that they had before. We try to recreate that bond of, we have this eternal plan and we have this plan of salvation and here's all the steps and the layers to this thing and try drawing it on a whiteboard. And, Mm -hmm. but it's when you, when you, when you step away from that and you're reconstructing or when you're trying to figure out where you are, it's, it is devastating because you're like, where am I going to go when I die? Where is grandma right now? Like what's going to happen to me? It is, it is very scary to face because before you had that sense of just surety. You just, I mean, you weren't even allowed to grieve as a Mormon, which mm-hmm. was one of my biggest issues with funerals. Mm-hmm. You couldn't even really grieve because it was like, oh, you'll see them again. Mm-hmm. So don't don't show too much emotion. Mm-hmm. Like, where's the space for the grieving, right? And so there wasn't. You, were, mm-hmm. you weren't really allowed to have a lot of space for grieving anything. And so once you lose that reassurance that you might see someone again, it really, it's devastating. You question everything. You worry about what's next. The three questions, where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Mm-hmm. You see, you want to find answers to those. And it's a hard hole to fill. Um, mm-hmm. And it's it's a devastating one, I think. Yeah. yeah. So. Thanks for sharing that. Just in general, I'm curious um, how you each processed grief and loss. So In that interim, before you have started, let's say, to rebuild, so you're still maybe in that place of, and I think we're, we do, I mean, ideally, I think we have loss as we live, right? I mean, we're kind of doing this all the time, Mm -hmm. but this is an exceptional time, I feel like, um, in transition. Do you want to share any things that were helpful to you or even just personally how you processed grief and loss during this time? Yeah, mine was probably not the healthiest. I would say I was heavily dissociated in the form of work. I think we spoke a little bit about dissociation in one of the previous episodes, but um, dissociation can look different than what people expect it to. I think a lot of people imagine that it's like this lazy state where you're zoned out or you're being spacey. And dissociation can be highly productive. A lot of people that own their own businesses and are very successful are big dissociators and that's like their coping mechanism for... Margie is making (laughs) weird faces at me right now. I just don't... John the workaholic. What? (laughs) Wait a minute. I I No shame. (laughs) No shame. Hey, we all cope differently. That's right. I don't Mm -hmm. know what any of you are talking about right now. (laughs) I'm not sure what you mean. (laughs) I'm sorry. Let me get back to my work here. (laughs) No time. No time to feel. (laughs) Back to work. (laughs) 
<laughs> yep. And so dissociation can look almost as if you have a motor inside of you that is propelling you forward to go yeah. and do. And, and so I really dove into my work during that time. And I was even looking back on some photos recently and thinking, did I not feel all of those emotions? <laughs> because that was a lot to be dealing with. And I don't remember fully feeling those emotions in that time, time period. Frame. I definitely felt them later on. But I think one of my mechanisms for dealing with how painful it was, was to just really throw myself into yes. work. Yes. Exit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think too, for me, I didn't always cope in the healthiest ways. I did, I did turn to therapy. That was a healthy way. Just trying to get reassurance of like, uh, what, what can I, what can I do? Like looking for direction. But I, I did cope with for me, eating food, food was always a thing. Dopamine seeking mm -hmm. um, distractions, right? ADHD, like diving into work, diving into the kids, diving into any anything else, sports, um, anything I could do to kind of not think about those big emotions mm -hmm. and not face those big emotions. But I'm a big feeler, and so it was hard to avoid them, and I would just break down and cry all the time. I just would just yeah. cry and cry and I was just like, I don't have an eternal marriage. Like, what's going to happen? And I just had anxiety and I just had even some OCD around those thoughts of like, I don't have the reassurance I've always had. And what, what's going to happen to me? And, what you know, will I be with my kids forever? And um, truly, if I hadn't stumbled into therapy, it would have really been a lot worse. But um, yeah. you had some great therapy. You had a few different therapists along the way. Yeah. It's amazing. That time. Therapy really did help kind of say like this is yours to reconstruct this is yours to yeah. feel and to you know you it's okay not to know yeah it's okay to say i don't know and i think a lot of mormons could cannot fathom not knowing yeah. because it's you either know or you don't and to say you don't know is like such a hard concept but there's also some freedom there saying you know mm -hmm. and i think agnostics always talk about this or like i don't know if something's there but i'm not going to deny that there might be Right, like I'm going to open my mind to the universe thinking that there may be a higher power, but I'm not sure. And I don't know all the things. And teaching kids, too, about, like, we don't know. Mom, it's, it's okay not and to it's know. it's okay. That's been... Yeah, yeah very here. There's a lot of power in learning that it's okay to not have all of the answers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, is there anything you want to say more about the deconstruction piece or the grief and loss, mm. or should we go ahead into rebuilding? Um... Think Thoughts? That's, we're probably good. That's to probably everything. Go into deconstruction, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, if we were going to touch on, I think one of the major places, and you kind of, uh, it showed up in grief and loss, which I love as a bridge, by the way, to rebuilding, because it's such a great tool, as well as like a help in processing grief and loss, was mental health, right? Mental health as a key component to rebuilding. Do you want to start there? Yeah, so I think um, I think anxiety and depression were always something that we had heard of in the church. Mm -hmm. It was not really ever addressed, but it was like, oh, so-and-so elder can't hack it and has anxiety and depression and needs to go home. We talked about mm -hmm. that with my mission. And it was always like this weird taboo thing, and we didn't know a lot about it. And I think we tried to learn more, I think, with Kim and postpartum. Yeah. After the kids, we, you know, understanding what postpartum was. You want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, I had a really rough experience with postpartum with all three of our kids, but it was by far the worst with our youngest baby. And we had kids very quickly. Uh, one of like the scrupulous beliefs I had was that I needed to have kids as quickly as possible. And that was because we believed our sole purpose on the earth was to multiply and replenish. And I took that very literally. So our first two are 13 months apart and our second and third are 18 months apart. And I had every, <laughs> I mean, I fully expected to have as many kids as humanly possible. And I then, wanted to be like the next Duggar family. I mean, terrible what actually happened with the Duggars, but that was the idea. Like how many children can I have? I want to have all the children. I want to do the best at this possible. And then the postpartum hit you so hard. And the postpartum hit really hard. We didn't really know what hard. it was. We didn't know what it was. It's not ever discussed. Mm -hmm. It's not what, What's mental health, right? Anxiety, depression, don't talk about it. Well, what was postpartum depression? Yeah. And postpartum OCD 
the intrusive thoughts can be absolutely terrifying. So it was with our third that it got really bad. You you were working two jobs. I was home with the kids. And it was probably around when she was six months old. And from what I had heard, like postpartum should be better by then. And I started having panic attacks, but I didn't have the words for them. I didn't know like this is a panic attack. This is anxiety. I just knew that it felt like I was dying. And if you've ever had a panic attack, It's like you can't breathe. The world is closing in on you. Everything feels so terrible. And in my mind, I thought maybe like it's just evil spirits, like I'm being tempted or I'm not being righteous enough. And I started dealing with these over and over. And then the intrusive thoughts started. That was scary. It's so painful looking back. Because the way that I was raised led me to believe, again, that there were those evil spirits around me and that if I had a bad thought, maybe I was being possessed. And I had intrusive thoughts like around danger for my family. Like I had this one intrusive thought that would come in over and over. And you just have to think of it on like repeat The ceiling fan is going to fall and it's going to cut your baby into a million pieces. And you see the image and it's like this plays over and over every night. Mm. And that was only one of them. It was like every night I was being tormented with all the possible ways that my baby was going to die. And I stopped sleeping at night because I thought I'm going to sleep through this. She's going to die. Like maybe these thoughts are coming from the Holy Ghost. He's manifesting to me that she's not safe and I need to protect her and I need to be more vigilant. So I'm going to stay awake all night long and I will not let anything harm my baby. And then thoughts started happening. Like I want to throw my baby against a wall and this thought would come in and this is an intrusive thought and you have no control. So if there's anyone watching this that has ever had this happen, I just want you to know this is not because you're bad or evil This is classic OCD Mm -hmm. and this can happen and you don't have any control over it. And even sometimes fighting it can make it worse. And so I was having these. By trying to make the thoughts go away. Yes. Yeah. Like in my mind, it was like, put a red stop sign up and that'll stop it. But that can actually be more damaging. Mm -hmm. So I'm having these thoughts just nonstop day and night. I'm barely sleeping and things really take a turn for the worse. We just, we didn't know. We didn't have any words for what was going on. We didn't know what mental health was. I was like, I must just be going crazy. Um, We reached out to a friend at church who was so kind and understanding. And I didn't tell her any of the intrusive thoughts that I was having because again, going back to that, terrible book if you say the thoughts that you're struggling with it gives satan more power over you that was what i believed so i never ever admitted those thoughts because i was so ashamed and i didn't want there to be power over me you didn't tell me either no i never did um Mm. and we had a friend that was helping us and she recommended that i go get therapy and i was like no therapy is for people that are weak Like, I've heard my dad tell me this for years and years. He's made fun of all of these mental health conditions. I'm not weak. I'm strong. I've always been strong. And it was so hard. But I wasn't sleeping. And I wasn't producing milk. And my baby was hungry. (laughs) Mm. So I finally saw a therapist. Mm. And the only thing I said was, I think I have postpartum depression. I didn't tell her any of the intrusive thoughts because I was too ashamed. Um, And just based on what I told her, she said, it's not safe for you to be alone with your children. And I felt like an absolute failure. I mean, this is my sole purpose in life is to be there for my children and to be a mother. And I've just been told it's not safe. I am not safe around my children and that I need to have someone in the home at all times with me for the next month. (laughs) Just so 
hard. Um, and had I had any understanding of mental health. Anything. Just yeah. anything. Mm-hmm. Oh, it could have been reframed. It could have been like, this isn't your fault. This is something that so many women deal with. Mm-hmm. And they deal with it in silence. And you don't have control over intrusive thoughts. You don't want to harm your baby. I always say it's like my brain has this like overactive threat assessment that's going on in my brain. It's like, what could possibly go wrong? Let's play out all of the scenarios so that we can keep the baby safe. What are the risks? And so that's what my brain was doing. And so I saw a nurse that day. I saw a therapist and I saw a psychiatrist and I got on medication and we got help from one of our sweet neighbors Um, this is in California. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we had a really great um teacher and and his wife and they stepped in and she the wife she knew. She knew about postpartum. Like Yeah. She she just knew. Yeah. There's something yeah. about women. They just know they're intuitive and and they deal with this in silence. And she had four or five kids of her own and all grown and and you finally did tell me about some of the intrusive thoughts too. You did open up to me as well. And I think the medication was also something there was a lot of stigma around, like you, you need you need medication. Like that's another weakness. Not only admitting that something might, might be wrong, but also that you need medication to help you. Mm-hmm. Which if anyone's listening now, especially young mothers, it's okay to see a therapist. Mm-hmm. It's okay to get medication. It may not yes. solve forever, but if it keeps you safe, um, just because you may not talk about it in your family or there's some sort of stigma or taboo around mental health or medication, um, you don't have to listen to them. And you can do the opposite of what your family has taught you and what your mm-hmm. church never taught you. And I think it really did help. Yeah, it because w- what, what did it, it, like, how did it help you? It helped with the intrusive thoughts. Um, I was able to start sleeping at night. I wasn't as worried about my daughter dying in the night. Um, I wasn't worried about me accidentally harming my kids Mm -hmm. because there was a time when the thoughts were so bad. I remember driving my car to preschool one day and I thought, if I just crash this car, these thoughts will stop and we'll be safe. My children will be safe from me Mm. and I'll be safe from the thoughts and we'll all, it'll all be better. What if I just crash the car? That was the first time you told me was Mm. the car. That was the memory I have of she kept it all to herself. Um, I did everything I could as a father to, to be supportive. And just raising kids is such a – it's so hard. And we had three under three. Three like under it was three. So much work. No, not a lot of family support. Um, yeah. And I think it was just – when you shared it with me finally, though, it allowed me to kind of help seek support. and You really stepped in. And, it was hard. And things got a lot better. Scary. And I started doing – therapy and that was really helpful but I um it was funny I was seeing a therapist who wasn't Mormon and so I wasn't honest with her because I felt so strongly I needed to protect Mormonism as a whole and her view of me like maybe I'm the only Mormon you've met I need to protect your view of Mormon we need to be Mormon women need to be strong and I can't tell you everything I'm dealing with (laughs) you won't understand me anyways Mm -hmm. and I just wish I would have been honest or felt like I could have told her because there was so much more I needed help with. Um, We got the help later, but oh, postpartum is no joke. Yeah. So as as long as along that theme of reconstruction, rebuilding, like having that mental health experience, I think that changes you, Mm -hmm. right? When you have a mental health experience, there was one more experience we've had with mental health. If you're okay, if I talk about, I had a sibling who um, was diagnosed as bipolar and went through a manic episode where they were not in their right mind. And when you think you might know mental health, like, oh, I know about anxiety and depression, there's so much more to mental health. There's mood disorders, there's personality disorders. And for me, I didn't know what bipolar disorder, I didn't know what it was. But I, all, I knew that my sibling was not in the right state of mind. And, and trying to get that adult sibling help during that time, and there had been some severe traumas that this sibling mm-hmm. had gone through, um, including being rejected by the Mormon community and, and being in part of the LGBTQIA community and, and losing, losing gay friends to suicide. Those traumas spiraled 
my sibling into a, a manic episode. Bipolar often gets misdiagnosed as depression until they see the other side, which is the manic episode. And for us to, to take a sibling into care around that, I, I just remember reading every book I could get my hands on about what is bipolar disorder, what is schizophrenia, what is per, what are personality disorders. Why do we not get taught any of this? Why is this never discussed? And luckily, this adult sibling got the help they needed, recovered, medicated, and, and basically back to a homeostasis, and, and everything was good. But we did understand what, like, and I think also too, when we talk about deconstructing systems and institutions, mental health services were terrible. It was mm-hmm. so hard to find someone that could help us mm-hmm. in this situation because cops and police get sent in and they don't have any idea what that's about. They're there to assess risk and they don't, if they're not a harm to themselves, then what do the cops care? And, and that just speaks to those, those institutions. But having these mental health experiences really opened up our eyes to a lot of things. So as we're reconstructing and rebuilding, we're thinking of we're thinking of postpartum. We're thinking of bipolar. We're thinking of these these things that have happened in our lives, these experiences that we've had firsthand right. that were shocking, they were scary, never discussed in it. Just have more faith. Just read your scriptures. You won't have anxiety and depression if you just do a, a few more things. It, it's like, no, these are actually real conditions. These are real mental health struggles. And that really, I mean, that changed our views too to become more liberal too. I think where we had grown up on a very conservative world where mental health is not discussed, we became more and more liberal with our views of, of that we, you need services, you need help. Um, and, and I think an understanding of mental health helped us have empathy and to have a, a type of love towards huma- humanity. Mm-hmm. It changed the way we, we, saw, we see others. Um, I really think that was a big part of, you know, understanding mental health, understanding therapy. It helped us rebuild from the ground up, mm-hmm. having those, those tough experiences. Yeah, um, that totally makes sense. And I'm hearing a lot too of, um, you know, really bringing forth things that were unspoken unsaid, right? So bringing things out of the darkness into the light with support around for you as you did it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really courageous. Yeah. All right. So we have the mental health kind of layer. We could go into some of the holes and see how you kind of, do you want to go to a place of like with rebuilding when it came to identity you know, what has that, we're, we're all journeying, we're not done, right? But so far with identity, are there components or pieces that you've rebuilt that you feel proud of or? Yeah, I, I, do you want me to start? <laughs> um, just rebuilding um, my identity around, uh, you know, roles, right? Like I don't have to be a perfect in my roles. I don't have to hold the anxiety of the father, husband. I also don't have to... Uh, be so masculine. I'm allowed to be a feminine mm-hmm. man. I'm allowed to, mm-hmm. um, gender norms are not, you know, a big part of it. And yep. this identity of, cause people will say uh, like, Oh, like, why are you so, wh- why do you care about emotional intelligence or why do you care about emotional load? And why do you talk about therapy all the time? And it's like, I still lift weights and watch football. I'm still a guy. Like I, I, I still define myself in that masculine, in those masculine ways. But I'm also comfortable in the femininity. I'm, You're I'm, a whole person. Yes, there's so much more to us than a gender role. Yeah. And so I think that's been great for our reconstruction as a couple because we've just embraced the fact that we are both masculine and feminine, and that you know um, a dad can be a, a, a de- can be different for every family, and so. That's been good for me to just not be, and also to not have the stress of being the priesthood leader Mm -hmm. who is responsible for the souls and his family about whether or not they do all of the milestones. Mm. And I think identity for you has also changed. Yeah, identity has changed a lot as we've rebuilt over the past few years. I think Um, there's been so many layers. I feel like First, accepting myself as a businesswoman and a working mom and all that that entails, because I definitely had shame and guilt around that mm-hmm. when I was in the church. Um, that's not always something that's well-respected. And 
allowing myself to fully lean into it's okay for me to do something that I love and even it's great for me to do something that I love because then I'm not putting all of this pressure on my children to perform yes. because I am lacking validation. Absolutely. And I feel like that's mm. been so beautiful to see our children just learn and grow and have room for error. And I have what fulfills me, which is my business. My children also fulfill me, but they're, I don't need their accomplishments to fulfill me. And I don't need their accomplishments to prove that I'm a great mom. Mm. Or that I'm doing what's right. It's like they have so much room and space in this new reconstructed world that we're living in where they can mess up. And I love that so much. I love that they aren't forced to be perfect and that they don't hold that heaviness of, am I enough? Am I going to be with my family in heaven? They get to learn and grow and make mistakes. And we encourage that. It just it's and like I, undoing the cycle that I went through like, of the perfectionism, the overachiever, yeah. just it's allowing beautiful. for children to fail, to to frolic, to to experience mm-hmm. all. I was I was telling or I was telling Margie earlier about how we stick the kids in all these different sports and activities and voice lessons and mm-hmm. what is it that you want to do? Find mm-hmm. your passions, mm-hmm. not you need to do football because Dad did football. Or and that reminds me too, um, Margie had mentioned as you leave the church a lot of times you find that you don't know too much about yourself and I think because we've always been told like you need to be this and you need to do that and this is what you enjoy and that's what you should get your happiness out of it's like you leave and all of a sudden it's like okay so who am I like what color do I actually like to wear and what clothing do I want to wear what makes me feel happy yeah and what do I want to do with my business And so I've had all this space to like figure out what movies do I actually enjoy because it's different than what I thought I enjoyed and that's okay. And also like, again, with the mental health, um, with rebuilding my own personal identity, I got diagnosed as being autistic, which came as a real shock when we first found out about it, but made so much sense. And suddenly I was able to look at my life through this new lens and be like, wow, this makes so much sense. This is why I I never felt like I fit in. This is why I always did things a little bit differently than everyone else. And I felt like the quirky girl. (laughs) This is why I have special interests where I find out, you know, about a cricket machine and I'm like, I need to know every single thing about this machine. And then I need to teach people about it. And it's like, wow, I wouldn't have that without autism. And I got diagnosed with ADHD as well. And then also OCD at the same time, which... Um, mm. was a lot to process. It's a lot of acronyms. Bunch. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. <clears throat> but it allowed you to embrace your identity and not have shame around mm-hmm. this new knowledge. Because to us, it's like people focus on that, like a diagnosis can have a stigma, but it's like, isn't it just new information? Mm-hmm. Isn't it just a new way to approach your life? Yeah. Isn't it just a new way to adjust the way you live your life to, so that you can have a better life? And yeah. isn't it just a characteristic about you? It could be a superpower. It can be a positive thing. Sure, it has its negatives, but it doesn't have to just be this all-consuming, defining diagnosis, I think. I view it more as like I have this new tool set that I didn't have before, Mm -hmm. and this information allows me to be handier. (laughs) Like I can fix things now. I can understand why do I struggle with this task or why do I struggle with this thing? Like, oh, I have a better way to frame the way that my brain works and understand that. And that's so powerful. It doesn't mean I, you know, I don't know. For me, it's just been really, yeah. really helpful to un- better understand myself yeah. and to not be worried about weaknesses because in the church it was always like, I don't want anything to be wrong with me because that's a weakness and that's a moral failing. Right. And now it's like, oh no, it's okay to have weaknesses and maybe imperfections yeah. and things that I'm working on and things that I'm struggling with. I think, I think, too, also you had the identity of, like, I don't necessarily know where I fall on the sexuality spectrum. Like, I don't have to define myself by yeah. this sort of heteronormativity or this, yeah. this, this you know, man and woman only or this mm-hmm. specific thing. Or maybe I'm asexual. Maybe, you know, like, just be able to just be able to question it mm-hmm. and have that be valid, I think. Wasn't that a big part of, yeah, well, for both of us, just to be able part. to say, have a safe space to question mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The things we like, yeah. the things we don't like. Yeah. Um, for me, I I got a lot of tattoos. <laughs> I kind of hit them on 
But I, you know, mm -hmm. some of the authenticity for me was to take back, um, and I have two sleeves on both my arms. And um, that was that was me taking back my identity. This is this is something that is important to me. And every single one of them has a meaning and has of uh, either family tie or my, my children or my wife or um, different aspects of my life and characteristics about me. Mm -hmm. So my identity mm -hmm. with tattoos has been a great journey. There's a lot of art that I've enjoyed more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even just hobbies and things that I've yeah. enjoyed around my identity, that, about be, be, embracing the nerd rather than having to be a jock. It's mm -hmm. embracing the, the things that I thought were not okay that to well, be and doing things you used to think were selfish and now you have the freedom to oh i like doing lego sets but <laughs> it used to be like if i have free time how should i be serving or yes. what should i be doing with this free time that's right it's like that tier of you know the best the best the thing that's worth your time mm -hmm. we we grew up right in yeah. that kind of hierarchy that pyramid of optimization as opposed yeah. to like what about rest? What about pleasure? What right. about enjoyment? Mm -hmm. What about, yeah. Right. You could always spend more time in your calling. You can always spend more time with your family. But like I often, I used to often say that Mormon men were terrible about spending time with other men, mm -hmm. just doing guys trips or doing things that were like platonic relationships and just doing things that were, that they wanted to do, right. To, to own their identity and not be, and I do think that women obviously are the second class citizen in Mormonism, that men do have it better. Mm -hmm. But even Mormon men struggle with their own brand of shame and guilt and what, what what's required of a father and a patriarch in a home. And there's not a lot of selfish things you can do. It's all self-sacrifice for, for your family. And you need to be able to be a person, have a personal identity and not just Absolutely. be a number. And yeah. so I I've, I've found great joy in communities of men and just friends just to do trips and not feel guilt about it and say, you know, we, and we take turns where you go do a girl's trip and I'll go do a guy's trip. And that feels great. And that's, it's well, something you've really had to work out though. <laughs> Getting comfortable with doing things for yourself has been a theme in therapy for the past year where your therapist is like, please do this thing for yourself. That's such an amazing <laughs> theme. And I love that you say work because I do think some of these things, they feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. when you've been so conditioned to endure, to suffer through, to, to reorient yourself to a place of like really enjoyment, pleasure, rest. I, I think it is a practice. It's effortful. Yeah. Yeah, my I was so shocked when my therapist was like, "You need to spend two days alone." I was like, "What?" Like, but just you need to do things and doing things you enjoy. That was so hard for me yeah. to, to say. I'm gonna go to the movies. I'm gonna go get a massage. I'm gonna mm -hmm. go like go just like to try to focus on just me. That's right. And yeah. it was an amazing experience. It's right, like its own form of exposure therapy because you had so many fears around. If I leave, everything crumbles or everyone yes. needs me there or someone will be injured or, and it was like, you would go and leave and be like, oh, everything went okay. Everyone's still alive. Like, yeah. I'm allowed to enjoy my time. <laughs> then you do it again and oh, it's still, everything's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. That's so real. Um, how about rebuilding with regard to community? How has that been? Yeah, we have found some of the most incredible people, I feel like, in the um, ex-Mormon community. We have a group of friends that we just adore. Like You've had best. a few of them on your podcast, but yeah. um, Shay and Amanda, Scott, were some of the first mm. friends you made in St. George. Mm. Um, All the love for them. Amazing people. Um, Shay's journey was really touching. Um, I have trans friends. Which is so cool. So something cool. That I didn't know that I could ever understand or, or or have in my life, and through Shay, I've met other tr trans women. In, women and heard their stories and former Mormons mm -hmm. and learning about gender dysphoria. And Down and Ashley Seely is another mm -hmm. couple that's Down was on Mormon stories as well. And St. George is just filled with great, great people. Um, some of them are hiding from their family in Utah <laughs> County. Um, others are just there to kind of 
And there are a lot of Mormons in St. George, but we found a great community of ex-Mormons. And that's just a few of the folks we've met. And yeah. great families who are just have values for their kids and they're doing their best. And and we're just trying to create a community. We don't we can't rely on our LDS Tools app mm -hmm. to find the families in the ward. We have to work harder to find the other families that are not on the list. And we have to make effort and we have to try to help our kids make friends with them. And mm -hmm. and the e extra effort, though, has been amazing and mm -hmm. it's hard, but... Well, it's neat. I think that we really get to build our own family now where it's it can be so much deeper, I feel like, once you leave the church and you can be open and honest with people about here are the things that I'm dealing with or I'm struggling with or here's what I've gone through. And I think you have to be careful to some extent not to overshare. I think we've definitely seen that in the ex-Mormon community because everyone's hurting and there's a lot of pain. So we've definitely had to learn like, okay, let's take it slow. I don't want, don't yeah. unload all of your trauma on me the very first time we meet. Like let's create a relationship first and, mm -hmm. and, um, and feed that and let it grow and, and slowly share. But, um, we have friendships. I feel like that we never would have been able to have within the church because you just couldn't be honest about what you were struggling with in the church. There was this need to be perfect. And I think I probably felt that more than most people feel. So for me, I guess it's been really validating to be able to be close to people and find, find, make our own little family. Yeah. Being vulnerable. Um, there, there's, and, and, but to an extent, right. You, yeah. I think we've always been advocates for getting a therapist and working on your own things, but to be able to resonate with others and, to even have some shared traumas and to, to then rebuild as a, as a community and to raise kids in a community of, of people that understand what you've been through can be very validating. It can be very fulfilling. Um, I think it also comes with some, I, I think you have to be careful too, right? Because you want to have some boundaries too, right? And it can be hard when you've lost so much family, you're trying to rebuild family too. And um, you have to be careful. And everyone has different standards, different uh, different coping mechanisms, different things that they want to enjoy as an ex-Mormon. And we've always found that, you know, peer pressure is never a good thing. Uh, uh, you should do what you think is best and live your own authentic life without judging the choices of others. Mm -hmm. You do what's best for you, live authentically, live your best life, um, but let also give us the space to do that as well. Um, and we found a lot of really good people in that space, and it's been people that we just never would have ever had associations with or just yeah. wouldn't have met or wouldn't have interacted with. And it's just some of the kindest, nicest people. Um, and just the lack of judgment is so mm -hmm. nice to just really be authentic and to just be a human being. And, yeah, you know, that you just don't get, you get those shallow relationships. You get the, I need to check off this box to say that I visited you or that mm -hmm. I need to, you're, you're you're within my geographical boundaries. It's like, is that friendship, or is yeah. that is that a statistic? Um, so it's been nice to have authentic, genuine relationships. Yeah. You do have to work harder. You do have to work harder to find, to find them. Yeah. You do have to put more effort into it. You can't just show up and find them. Yeah. So. All right, just a couple more here. Okay. Um, but I did want to let you talk about parenting. I know that's been a big one um, that you've rebuilt with a lot of shifts. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I think um, my default's always to parent with fear mm -hmm. just because that's kind of how I was raised. And so yelling or threats or just compliance, and that's never a healthy way to do it. And I still fight that all the time because it feels like that was what well, was the way to do it. And through deconstruction and now reconstruction, it's fear is a great motivator. It's effective, but it's a terrible type of motivator. Like it's not, it has lasting impacts mm -hmm. and there's an, there isn't a connection, like you said, with children. And so parenting from love, um, having that connection with the child and also admitting when you make mistakes, right? Because we're not going to be perfect and we're definitely not. Um, but to say, you know, I'm daddy, dad is sorry for yelling or dad made a mistake here, but, but, but to mostly try to just parent with love, to parent with gentle, kind ways, um, letting them grow, letting them make mistakes, letting their failures be okay, not judging them, not giving them a list of do's and do nots, yeah. 
that's been but still having boundaries at the, at the sure. same time that's one of the things my therapist has had to talk to me about is you can be kind all you want but you still need to have boundaries i'm like oh okay right but it's definitely been a huge shift as we've left the church with how we parent because before so much pressure was placed on our children to perform in a certain way it's like we need to show up to church and we need to look perfect and everyone needs to be dressed a certain way and you need to sit quietly and reverently through this entire sacrament meeting come to find out all of our children are neurodivergent and that is very difficult and we don't have to feel shame about that anymore it's not some moral failing on our part it's neurodivergence makes it hard to sit still and focus for three hours yeah. or two now yeah and it's definitely affected how we parent I think also um distancing myself from my own family has really changed the way that I parent because I think long term about what are the effects of the ways that I parent if I lose my temper if I parent from a place of anger and rage and if there were physical abuse like my kids don't have to stay in contact with me and like I want to create a relationship where they want to come home once they're an adult <laughs> in a healthy way, not in a way where we're enmeshed, but in a way they're, where they're like, I enjoy being at home with my parents and I feel safe. And I want to make sure that we're fostering that environment, but also, you know, teaching them and helping them to grow and allowing for mistakes because mistakes are such a vital part of growing up and not being shamed for making mistakes. That's such a good yeah. example because... I just, you'll see this a lot in the mental health space on Instagram and TikTok around why would your adult children not want to come home for Christmas? It's like, well, how are they treated when they're there? Yeah. And our job is to want them to want to be around us, you know, to have that relationship. Obviously, yeah. we we have to empower them to go and do and to be productive humans, but we want them to want to come home for the holidays and to want to spend time with us. And, and if there's a power fear dynamic, it's... It's just not as it's not healthy, and if there's a sort of encouragement and love, it's just such a better place to parent from. I'm so glad that we left when we did and learned those things when we did because we were about to experience all the milestones and the baptismal covenants and the things that you commit to with our seven year old daughter about to be eight. We were, I mean, if we had given her that, yeah, and the way that she follows rules. It would have been devastating to her because she would be judging herself against this standard that, and that's the thing about extended family too, is like you take your kids to extended family and if they can't respect this new form of parenting, this, this, these new boundaries we have, it's not healthy for the kids to see that. We're trying to break cycles, not continue the cycles, right? And sometimes breaking cycles requires big boundaries. Mm -hmm. And you try to explain your boundaries in a way that's respectful of past mm -hmm. generations. But if they're not open to change or to allowing you to have the autonomy to parent your own kids, sometimes you have to be the bad guy and set the, the hard boundary. Yeah. And I don't think generationally that's been widely accepted around, around a certain yeah. age group. So that's, I think there's a lot of millennial parents struggling with that right now. We definitely have. Uh, but it's important that we, we establish those boundaries. I think we've also found our ability to parent in a healthy way is directly correlated with the health of our marriage. Mm -hmm. And the stronger we are together, we're more united in the way that we parent. But also, if you and I are fulfilling each other's needs and we're fulfilling our own needs we don't have to turn to our children anymore to be that mm. source of comfort, mm -hmm. to be there doesn't need to be parentification in our home because we're fully invested in each other yeah. and we're not going to allow our children to fill that void. If one of us is hurting, that's for us to deal with, with each other or with our therapist. It's not anything that needs to be, our children don't need to bear that burden. And project our problems on our children. And it's like, you don't want to go to your parents when you're having a marital issue, you're supposed yeah. to go to a therapist. You don't want to go to your children either. And so I had a lot of triangulation and parent parentification too. And it's just, it can destroy relationships. Some of my sibling relationships are so strained because there was triangulation with parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so my, my kids will never feel that. In fact, sometimes I see my kids and the things that they don't have to deal with. And I'm just like in shock and awe about how beautiful 
your life is as a child in this home, and it's not perfect. We make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> we really do. We admit them all the time. We apologize all the time. We try to be transparent that we're not perfect, and adults are not perfect. And you yeah. should question adults. You should have critical thinking. Um, but I, I look at them sometimes and go, I just can't even fathom growing up like this. Mm-hmm. Like the other day, Lincoln called you out. You had said something, and he goes, no. You can't tell me to do that. That is not fair. You can't talk to me that way. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Had I spoken to my parents like that, first off, I never would have. But also, thank you for calling out that we were being unfair because you would raise your voice at him and it wasn't fair. And I was like, I'm proud of you that you feel like if we're out of line, you can say, hey, you're not treating me fairly. Because in our new relationship, it's not like the parent is up here and the child is down here. It's like there's respect and respect goes both ways. We don't just respect our elders. We also treat our children with respect because they need to see that modeled. And that yeah. goes for adult children as well, yeah. not just children under 18. That's right. Right? Respect goes both ways. That's right. That's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, it really strikes me, I feel, particularly with themes around seeing your children and creating safety for them, not just with their brains, their actual, you know, how their brains function, but also um, their hearts and physical, their physical environment as well. And it strikes me that sometimes when we grow up and our needs aren't met in some of those ways, that they're the guiding lights in how we know maybe a little bit of what our kids might need. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the place where we can start. Yeah. It's beautiful to, it's beautiful to see. All right. Here's my last, let's see. Mm, I just said last two. Okay. Here's the deal. I would love to hear what you feel most proud about right now in this journey. It could be individually, it could be as a couple, but Like if we're going to just say mm, things that you feel most proud about, victories in this rebuilding, you know, what comes to you? I think for me, it's really been finding my voice. Like when we first got married, (laughs) you always joked that I like couldn't speak Mm -hmm. and I, and I couldn't, I struggled with alexithymia, which is like the inability to really relate to the feelings that you're experiencing. I was heavily dissociated and it was really hard for me to know what I was feeling. I was very aware and very empathetic to the needs of everyone around me, but I always put myself last. And I think the thing that I'm most proud of is the work that I've done to find my voice, to find what's important to me and really to work hard at coming out of that dissociative state and being present with all of my emotions because I really didn't experience the full spectrum of emotions until after Mormonism because so many times there isn't the safe environment or you're not encouraged to really feel anger or sadness. It's just like we always have to be happy and we always have to be good and we're perfect at all times. And it was like, no, sometimes things are really painful. And sometimes I feel really angry and that's okay. Like it's okay to feel anger. And how do we process that anger? And how do we work through those big emotions? So I think finding my voice has been this overarching theme for me in the past few years. And that has involved a lot of, we did a lot of EMDR. We did a lot of working on boundaries, setting boundaries. Um, it's changed even like the way that I work with my employees. Like when I first started hiring employees, I couldn't even tell them like, I need you to do this. I was like, oh my God, no, whatever you want to do. Like, it's fine. I'm just so happy to have you. And now I'm to a place where I'm like, oh, I can give feedback. It's okay if I have feedback. That's something I'm allowed to do. Yeah. Well, even the first time you got mad or sad, mm-hmm. like we've been married 13 years and the first 10 years of our marriage, I never really saw you get mad. Yeah, I don't even know if you really saw me cry. Or cry or re- express emotion. It yeah. was so dissociative. Mm-hmm. And three years ago, I started going through therapy, and I was like, she's mad. I almost <laughs> got excited. I was like, 
Yes, we can change that. Of course we can. Like I've always been the emotional one, right? And she's always been the more stoic one. And I think that was beautiful to see you find your voice, stand up for yourself, especially with your family. It's a huge victory. Um, I think mine is also standing up for myself with a um, very enmeshed community. Um, it's hard to sort of be isolated from all that family and to, to set those boundaries with family, to start saying that these are the ways yes. I'm going to start doing things. Yep. To actively choose to set new standards for my family, to, to break those cycles, yeah. um, even though it comes at a personal loss of community. Because had I been really selfish at, at first, I could have said, no, 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 we'll go through the hoops, we'll go through the motions so I can keep my community. And I had I had really thought that was what we could do. Like mm-hmm. we, could, we could just go, mm-hmm. you know, we could be the, go through the, the motions and show up and pretend for the sake of the community. And so um, just being willing to stand up to some of those big voices like grandparents and aunts and uncles and to just tell them that, no, I'm going to do my life the way I want to do my life and I'm going to raise my kids differently. I'm going to break these cycles. And um, I think that's probably what I'm most proud of as a victory. Yeah. I used to really be a huge people pleaser and to see you come out of that and find yourself and find what makes you happy has been really beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we celebrate you, <laughs> really. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing with us. Beautiful. <clears throat> well, that's really inspiring. And it's only like seven hours in or something like that. <laughs> that's quite the therapy session, John. <laughs> I said to Margie, we're doing today in three, three hours we're doing today. And then I met you guys and started learning more about your story. And I'm like, all right, Margie. Long day. <laughs> Thank you Let's for having us. Let's drop in. So <laughs> it's, a, it's 8 p.m. <laughs> we started at 10. So here we are. Anyway, thanks for driving all the way down, all the way up, but most importantly, um, Josh and Kim, thank you so much for your courage. Mm-hmm. It's no small thing to be a social media influencer yeah. where you got to imagine some of your audience are LDS. Oh, definitely. And you fight and scratch for every little bit of support and endorsement. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's so many dentists and doctors and lawyers and business people that I interact with. And I get it where they're just like, I... Oh, I've got great stories to tell, but I'm never going to tell my story because I don't want to hurt business, you know? And uh, again, no judgment. Um, People need to be and feel safe. And I love what, you know, uh, I love what I have seen, which is that it takes a lot of courage to be a whistleblower. But when you do, you it helps other people. It's probably the number one way to help other people is for just to, for us to raise our voices. And that doesn't happen unless people make sacrifices and show courage. And you both did that today. So I just want to thank mm-hmm. you. We honor you mm-hmm. and we want to express our thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your platform with us yeah. and allowing <laughs> us to speak with you both. It really means so much to both of us. And for all the work you've done, truly a pioneer in this space. I mean, the amount of people you've helped. Um, and I think like Margie said, every person has a story that can help others. And mm-hmm. we're just grateful to tell ours and hope that it helps others. And we love to listen to all the stories that you talk about. And, and, and I just, it's just amazing what you've done in this space. And it's crazy how I used to think that he was like the scary person. Like that's how the they, antichrist I, was. <laughs> they villainized him when I was in the church. And now here we are um, having a tender heart moment with him and, just grateful for all you've sacrificed in your life to yeah. put this kind of content out there and to tell stories, to tell truth. Um, and, and Margie, how intuitive you are and how feeling you are, like such an example of a parent and a mother and, and of just re- of growth and rebirth. Mm-hmm. And mm. you're just amazing individuals. Mm. You really are. Thank you for that. All right. Well... Uh, to close, I want to thank Margie. Thanks for being here and being my 
partner in truth and righteousness, as I like to say. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining. That's a lot right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Julia, for helping out with the time codes and show notes. Maven with the post-production. Gerardo with the thumbnails and all the help he gives, which is Legion. And, of course, our board. I want to thank everyone, all the donors. We couldn't do this without the donors. We're grateful for the Super Chats, uh, but really it's the monthly donors that are our bread and butter, and and they make all this possible. And so thank you if you are a donor. We couldn't do it without you. If you, don't, um, if you don't currently support Mormon Stories Podcast, but you find value in it, we, uh, we make a call. We ask that you please go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, and become a monthly donor. If all you can afford is 10 bucks a month or whatever, that's great. If you can afford more, that's great. But we, we rely on your donations. We have you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of viewers and listeners at this point and a maybe 1500 donate. Um, if, if we just had, you know, a few of y'all sign up, that can make a huge difference. So please, uh, support us if you can at mormonstories.org and y'all have a YouTube channel as well. Let's give you one last chance to plug it. You always make me plug it. Do you want to plug it? It's called Sweet Red Poppy. If you want to follow us, we would love that. I share all things crafting and DIY. I love to teach crafting tech. So anything like a sewing machine, a cricket machine, Glowforge, a serger. I quilting. am quilting even. Yes, I'm quite the crafting enthusiast. So I would love it if you gave us a follow. It's brilliant. And you do courses. And, and we do courses. Yeah, yeah, we have a book and yeah, ebooks, wow, online courses, things. patterns. Lots of free files. SVG files and sewing patterns on our website as well. We're on every social platform too. So all right, beautiful. We'll keep up the great work. If any of your fans are watching or listening for the first time, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Subscribe to Mormon Stories podcast on YouTube and Facebook, and everywhere else, TikTok, Instagram, and subscribe. Subscribe to. Red Poppy, what Sweet is it? Red Sweet Poppy. Red, Sweet Poppy Red Poppy YouTube channel and all the others. All right. <laughs> That's right. All right. I'm exhausted. Thanks for joining <laughs> us today. Uh, join us again soon for another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. And, uh, you know, please be aware that this book, Visions of Glory, is ultimately causing a lot of harm, intentional or unintentional. It's, it's causing a lot of harm including deaths, uh, not to be overly dramatic. So please talk to whoever you want to talk to about it and let's figure out a way to make this book, I don't know, um, have less, at a minimum, cause less harm. Thanks to everyone again. Take care. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. And we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care. <laughs>